like I see a guy with a Confederate flag over there. Welcome to Teaching While Queer, where we are providing queer folks working in education with a community to feel less alone and unload the burden of identity politics so you can work and live as your authentic self. I'm your host, Brian Stanton. My pronouns are he, they. I am a theater pedagogue and educator in New York City, and I am so pleased to have you here. Please enjoy Teaching While Queer. In today's conversation, you will uncover practical strategies for creating safe environments for queer students within educational settings, gain insights into the impact of representation and visibility in curriculum and classroom discussions, and learn how personal authenticity can positively influence both students and colleagues fostering a more inclusive school culture. Hi, Phil. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you, Brian? I am doing fantastic. Do you mind taking a second to introduce yourself to the listeners? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Phil Hular. I am a theater and stage design teacher over at Booker T. Washington High School for the Performing and Visual Arts here in Dallas, Texas. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. So I love that there's so many of us uniting on this. Um, for sure. Let's talk a little bit about uh, you. What was life like for you as a queer student? So I was born and raised in New York, and I was a uh, first-generation American, both my parents being uh, Latino from Brazil. It, it was one of those situations where being queer was like, as long as it wasn't a member of your family, live and let live was always thrown around a lot. It really came down to, at least being in New York, it was really easy to see who was safer than others. Like I was born in 89, so I'm, I'm very much a knee deep millennial there. And we're getting into that point of by the time I was in high school, like the term safe spaces was just being coined. So for a lot of times, we really had to just trust our own gut, really trust our gaydar for all intents and purposes. What do you think of Madonna? We can just go with the eye from there. Survey says gay. Yes. I fully relate to that. I'm, um, five years older than you, so just a little bit behind or ahead of all of those things happening, but definitely understand the kind of queer coding that we had to do in order to identify each other. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think your experiences growing up have impacted you as in ed have impacted your work in education? The big thing for me is, and it's always been as an educator, I always, want, I always fell into this idea of I, I want to be the person I needed when I was younger. I wish I could tell you that I found this really prolific ideology or mantra for myself from a fortune cookie or something like from like a mentor. No, I found it from a Tumblr post when I was younger, I was just scrolling and I found it and it was something that just felt really knee, near and deep to me. And I didn't really quite realize it until I really became an educator that it was something that I always aspired to be the person you needed when you were younger. because. I didn't have a queer mentor or somebody to really work and identify with it. The closest would be my friend Rachel's uncle, him and his husband, Eugene and Pilly. They were like my own gay uncles that really helped me explore my sexuality and my gender. And in the context of just being like, hey, this is who you are. This is what it means. And this is the community that we openly accept. And, and it's always been a sense of home for me in that situation, always going over to their house and being with them and just being my truest authentic self there. Because eventually when I did come out, I did have to leave my house for a couple of days. And they were one of the first people that I went to saying, hey, I, I need that next level of help. I think that's so important because I don't think we realize the impact that people have on us until later in life. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. And sometimes in the moment we think it's good and then we realize well, down the road that it's bad. And so I think that mantra of being the person you needed when you were a kid is so incredibly important right now because there's so many of us who went through life without having a queer role model. I 100% agree with that. You and I probably would know from a similar situation where we didn't really have any sort of media and anything for us to really connect to. The closest was what maybe Frasier, and that wasn't even a show really geared to our audience. So we had to find characters that were queer coded, but would never openly 
out as queer. For me, a big one would be like Sora from Digimon, who I really queered it as like a bisexual icon and like this tomboy as gender bending aesthetic. And I just like that connected to me so well, even though she was a girl to me, especially being non-binary, I was like, that's where I'm like feeling gender wise. Absolutely. I think that it was almost a game to figure out which character was him, the one that we connected with the most, who showed up as someone who represented us, even though it wasn't meant to be explicit. Though I have to say that there were a lot of writers and artists, especially in the animation field, who did those things on purpose to make oh, sure 100%. That the representation was there without being overt. What would you say is like a character for you that really connected in that fictional character in that situation? Here's the wild thing, right? I grew up on Doug, and I think that Skeeter was like his best friend. And I think of Skeeter as being a little bit queer coded at times because yeah. he was he was artistic and he was always with his best friend. Like he was definitely I don't know. The only phrase that's coming to mind is inappropriate, but it grows before Rose. But he's there for his best friend. And like, even when crap was going on with Patty Mayonnaise, Skeeter was solid. And so I think that he represented to me like some of the experiences that I had where I was like the friend on the side while my friends were dating. Yeah. No, 100%. And like, I really resonated with Skeeter as well. And Doug, just because he was so, like, it was, like, coded, but in a weird way as a person of color. Like, it, it was, like, blue. Think that. Skeeter, he was blue. And it, it was so odd in that situation where in that show, like, the people of color were actually, like, different viper colors, especially, like, Roger and Skeeter and so on. For me, I totally get where you're coming from. Like this sense of closer relationship that is bigger than just being friends. That, that, that there's a certain level of removing a toxic masculinity. And just like, it's okay to be intimate and close with your friend who is a guy when you are a guy. Yes, exactly that. The idea of just having a relationship that's beyond the activities that you do together. Mm -hmm. We're friends because we're on the baseball team. Or we're just friends. It's okay to just be friends and have this actual relationship with someone where you're just talking about things or enjoying activities together and not letting that activity define your entire relationship. Yeah, especially when that activity is removed from the equation, like that it you can start seeing that friendship has always been there and that you lean on us. So thinking about relationships and, and just how you handle relationships with people, what are some of the things that you do when you're confronted with anti-queer behavior? For one thing, I'm, I'm very fortunate, especially as a teacher, where I teach at a performing arts school. We're fortunate enough in a situation where it's a public school system at Dallas ISD. But even though it's still a public school, students still have to audition. They're auditioning not just on their inherent talent coming into ninth grade, but how's your grades? How's your moral character? These are things that really play a role in our school. So we're very fortunate as a magnet school that can do that. And when we do find that there is anti-queer behavior occurring, oftentimes that more comes from a place of immaturity of where they were beforehand. And usually like social Darwinism kind of kicks in, like us as teachers can step in very quickly, but our students are also very good at educating them and being like, hey, this is not okay. And who are you to say that this student, uh, you know, is a girl when he is a trans man? He is saying he is a man. If you have a problem with that, please keep going. For me, being younger and like just in general, I'm still in Texas and living in a very much a red state in a blue city. I can say with confidence, funny enough, that since I've moved to Dallas, I've actually accounted less anti-queer behavior living in Dallas versus when I was in New York. And I think part of it was just because Dallas is almost like in also like other like major cities in Texas, like Austin and Houston. It's like, we know we are the minority in this situation. So we overcorrect so quickly when we find injustice when it comes to minorities of any kind. In New York, it was always like, oh, you get a thicker skin, you're in New York. And somebody's going to call you in the F word, hey, at least he didn't punch you in the jaw. And that's like that weird irony in that situation. When I do encounter it here, honest to God, I'm fortunate enough now being older that I know that like 
when they do say it, they have to rely so much in numbers. It's almost like in a reverse where I needed a strong enough numbers to be out as a queer person. Now it's the reverse where a lot of homophobic people or anti-queer people, they need numbers to be able to be more comfortable being that hateful. They need to be like, okay, I think I see a guy with a Confederate flag over there. Bah, and then say something mean because thinking they have somebody on their back. And it's, there's something blissfully, cautiously optimistic about that. I'm fortunate enough that like of where I work, where I live, when it does happen, social Darwinism kind of kicks in really fast. When back then for me, when that happened, we just had to be, first thing I always did was cover my head. Because I don't know if they were going to throw something at me. And if, at the very least, if they throw something, hopefully it's not heavy and it's not hitting my head. Right? I don't care if it ruined my clothes. I don't care if it grazed my body on my skin or my torso. I just got to make sure I didn't get a concussion. Right? Yeah, I hope that answers that question. It's so interesting because to some extent, I can validate your work and to some extent, I cannot. When I was teaching in San Antonio, I had a different kind of discrimination happening where I literally had people running on the school board to hit the faggot out of our school. That oh, wow. was me I'm the faggot at the school. I had been teacher of the year and I just had a spotlight on me. They did not like that. It became a huge thing. But to the same extent, I moved to New York City and I deal now more with individuals saying stupid shit than I did in San Antonio. And I think part of it is also because Southern hospitality forces you to be nice to someone's face talk crap about them behind their back so yeah there's a little bit of relief that comes from that because while no one ever said you know i, I want that faggot to get out of my school and you faggot to my face in san antonio there were like meetings and like yeah. videos and like all these things happening quote unquote behind closed doors but no here, for sure staff nearly People are like, I'm just going to tell you what I think right now. And it's funny because my response is always, God, how did you know? <laughs> yeah. I was being so subtle. Oh, like, my God. And, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for telling me. I had no idea. Because in, in my opinion, that has more to do with them than it does with me. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. There is the option of violence, but a lot of times when I'm dealing with folks, even here, there is that idea of if they're by themselves, it's like I'm, my head is popping up behind something and I'm saying what I need to say and I jump back down and I hide yeah. because there's not a comfort with being an outright homophobe or anti-queer just in general. Yeah, without a doubt. I had someone talk on me on the subway and there were at least six people I didn't know behind me ready to beat this dude if he were to touch me. And luckily, I diffused the situation and got him off the train. But it was like that there was a community of people behind me being like, no, nah, this isn't okay. And I think you're right in that sense of like, it's not cool yeah. to be a, a queer. It's not cool to be discriminatory. And if you are going to out yourself like that, you're taking a risk. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I started teaching during COVID. So my first classroom was on Zoom in Google Classroom. I was fortunate enough that Dallas ISD wanted to interview me as a first year teacher during COVID. I was the sponsor for GSA. But just being on camera at Fox 4 News, our local news in Dallas, I got so much hate on Twitter and Facebook. I've been called like, a, I was called a breeder, uh, a groomer. I was called, I, I was saying, that I, I, this is crazy. This one's my personal favorite that I, I definitely drink. What's that chemical that was really popular during like QAnon that like it kept us young by drinking the fear of children's blood. I forgot what it was, but I was like, literally like, there's no way that this person looks 30 years old. There, if, if he is 30 years old, it's because he's drinking the youth. And I'm like, what were you talking about? It was honestly hilarious. But yeah, but That's funny enough that people are willing to sleep. Exactly. But you know what? Like going back to the people in the comments being like, what are you talking about?
I'm Shanna Merton, host of the Tech Tools for Teachers podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. That's really money. This will be the audience participation section of the show. For those of you who are listening, please raise your hand if you've ever been called a groomer. My hand is up two weeks ago. It's so dumb because mm-hmm. I, I literally go, could you do just like a tiny bit of research to find out who is actually grooming children and who are actually the pedophiles in, in the world? And maybe we should solve that problem instead of just demonizing a whole community. That has nothing to do with the situation. Recently, a gay porn star was caught with child pornography. And it makes me so mad because I'm like, dude, first of all, disgusting. Second of all, now you're giving people more ammunition to go against the queer community. And I, I have so many frustrating things that I would say. As an educator. It is already hard enough to get my students to do their Photoshop homework. If I was going to groom anybody, it would be to turn in their assignments on time. <laughs> that would be my big thing. Yeah. On, yeah. I, these are Wait. the things that teachers would want to groom. And I feel like if they didn't actually work, the parents would be happy about it. Exactly. Oh. Just, I'm sorry. I, I don't care. I, I don't care enough as an educator. That if you're coming up to me while I'm teaching, right? I'm not thinking about your sexuality or your gender while I'm teaching. I just want to make sure that you understand the context because that is my job. Now, granted, after school or after class, if you need to talk to me, I'm here to listen. Absolutely. I can be that listening ear, that sense of mentorship. But I can promise you this. If I had the ear of the youth, as older teachers like to say, it would be for them to be able to turn in their assignments on time. So I can grade them on time and not be as behind as I usually am. My favorite is when someone sends something in late and then they're like, I turned it in. Why haven't you graded it? Like five seconds later, because it was due to being CEO. Go. I, I go, right. I see my students go through the five stages of grief in that situation. Absolutely. So thinking about being yourself and being authentic in the workplace, what advice would you give to someone from the queer community about showing up authentically at work? The first thing I always say is, is, is mind your safetyness, right? Authenticity is important, but it's okay to be, but it's more important for you to be able to make it to the other side in the end, right? Regardless of how you want it to define authenticity, you will always be queer, right? I'm non-binary and I, I don't prescribe to hetero male prescription, but I do dress still very mask. That doesn't make or remove my queerness in your life. I have a son right now. I have a son in my, and I, my partner is a cis woman, right? But we are in a very queer defining relationship, but my, and we're still trying to explore things for what the child should call me because it's not going to be dad and millennials have already ruined the word daddy. It's not going to be those things, but that doesn't remove the authenticity of who I am as a queer person. Right. And that's in, in a safe environment of just being a parent. And when we define the authenticity, I always start with, what are you most comfortable with, right? Where you're most comfortable with is your authentic self, right? And that authenticity changes over time, right? Because how we define authenticity and queerness changes over time, right? Back then, not even like maybe, what, 10 years ago, authenticity for queerness was being a Lady Gaga fan, right? If you were a Lady Gaga fan, you were probably in our alphabet club. Right? 20 years before that, probably Madonna. Right? Now, Chaperone is really out there, right? <laughs> Cheer for all the oldies. Exactly. And so when we talk about authenticity and we talk about like, how do you show up to work being queer? I always like to start with the fact of, do you feel safe? If you do feel safe, show a little bit more. Come in with makeup if you know that it's safe for you. If it's not, then maybe coat it in with some eyeliner. I paint my nails, not right now, because I've been working with my hands all summer, and I don't want to waste money doing it at the time. But I paint my nails, I do my makeup, and when I feel safe, I do it to the highest degree. If I know I need to be outside of Dallas to do it, I'll wear maybe something a little bit more conservative, but I still always have, say, our video listeners, I always have a non-binary earring that I always wear. 
something very subtle for me. My tattoo, for example, has a non-binary product on it as well, right? Something that is just for me just to as a touchstone to my queerness. Something for me to just come back and be like, yes, I'm still here. Absolutely. I think that is uh, so interesting and an interesting perspective on it because I think you're absolutely correct in that authenticity just it over time. And ultimately, you need to do what's going to be most accessible for you. Having those little things for yourself that are like, you're almost like you're linked to who I am, even when I have to go into a space. It's almost like you have this little piece of armor with your earring and your tattoo of, I'm still me, even though today I'm dressing in drag as like a more heteronormative person. And so I think that it's incredibly insightful information because sometimes when we were teachers, we do have to put on armor and we do have to go into work and be more quote unquote professional. Mm -hmm. So this is our professional persona, as it were. When you're doing that, there's still a level of you in the center. Mm -hmm. That is authentic. Yeah. And especially as an educator, right, we want to be mindful of that as well, because we want our students to know those levels of boundaries as well. Part of that conversation is knowing, hey, how do you handle when you're not as much of in a safe environment as you usually are, right? And on the flip side, if you're at a school that's not safe and that you do have to hide or shield that authenticity a little bit more, right? What are the key points that can highlight it? Is it a pen? Is it a earring? Is it maybe not a tattoo? Not necessarily a ninth grade, but who knows? But what do we define that? And it's for educators like us and queer educators, when we work with students, it's all about establishing that boundary. Like, what are those lines? And knowing that those lines changes year after year, and that's part of our job to, so that we, we remain relative, right? I don't put signs on my door anymore that I'm a safe space because I know now, especially in Gen Z culture, it's a given. It's an expectation, Right. Back when I was in high school, we needed that. Now it's not so much. Now it's almost to them. They're like, why is there a safe space sign on my door? It, it, it should be. That would be like a, a pilot saying, hey, we're going to land safely. Gosh, I hope so. That's the bare minimum. So we, we need to be cognizant of flight, how we establish when, and educate what that authenticity means and how we deliver it. Absolutely. What, in general, do you think the educational community can do to be more inclusive of queer people? I think it just simply just regarding that they exist plays a big role. I remember at one point when I was in, granted this was in college, but in my U.S. history class, my teacher, who is a straight man, his name is John Ponsar, he passed away a couple of years ago. He talked about Marsha Johnson, had a whole unit, a whole day talking about her and talking about what the Stonewall riots really were. I'll be honest, even as a queer person, I didn't know Stonewall. I was in New York. I wasn't familiar with Stonewall. Social media was just becoming a thing. How we define and absorb information was so different then, where now it's so easily given. I needed to hear it from an 80-year-old, old Italian Jewish man just telling me right off the bat, hey, this is Marsha Johnson. She took good care of you guys. So everybody here in the Alphabet Club, you thank her, okay? The next time you're out of Pride and you're there sh sh hanging out shirtless, no, it was because of a trans woman throwing her shoes at a cop, telling him to go fuck themselves. And I'd be like, thank you. Yes. For me, I, I bring that in the context of, in regards to bring it into my content, right? I teach theater. It's very easy for me to incorporate queerness into theater, right? whether if you want to gender Ben, Romeo, and Juliet, right? Whether you want to talk about a play like Bent, right? There's tons to really use. And it's ultimately, to answer your question, how do we incorporate more idea of queerness into our classrooms and to the world? It, the answer is just effort. To take the effort, take the time, right? It's unfortunate in my situation where like June worked on the school, so it's hard to celebrate New York. We don't end school till the end of June. Incorporate Pride Month just as much as you would incorporate Black History Month, Women History Month. For us, we really str strongly encourage wearing pronouns on something simple as pronoun stickers on our ID badges. Is it required? No, but we know well enough in our culture, right? That if we see, even if a cis hetero man 
wearing a he, him sticker, we identify that easier as a person who's an ally than a person who isn't. It's just just showing that inclusivity that it does exist. Absolutely. I love that idea of just, it seems so counterintuitive to have to say this in 2024, but holding the effort yeah. to acknowledge that we exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it's really that easy, right? U.S. history, bring up Marsha P. Johnson. Music, bring up queer musicians throughout, throughout history. We do all the things, right? Computer science, they talk, they talk about Alan Turing, right? It took till the 21st century for students to realize that those people were queer. It, 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 it was okay to say that out loud them. Absolutely. So we're getting ready to wrap up here, and we've got a question from one of our listeners. This one comes from Caleb in New York. And Caleb asks, how did you know you were queer? I knew I was queer from... My mom took me to a summer camp. It was a YMCA summer camp on Long Island. And there was these two boys. They were brothers named Nick and Anthony. And the day camp was co-ed, but the counselors matched your gender at birth, right? So I was all around all boys with a male counselor, right? The last couple of days, it was when we were allowed to really just like, just do our own thing. It really just have fun. And we would always hang out with the girls for a while. It was something that I always looked forward to a year. This was the thing I looked, at, I looked forward to all of summer. It's why I begged my parents to take me there. It was when I get to hang out with the girls and they got to put makeup on. And they paint my nails. I was, what, maybe 10 or 11 years old. And here I was, excited, not from the pool or hiking in the woods or the camping, but for this one or two days near the end of the camp session that I get to hang out with the girls and they make me pretty and make me feel comfortable. I loved it and adore it. And I still think about it every, every once in a while when I ask myself, like, when did I realize that was queer? I was very fortunate that sense of toxic masculinity just didn't exist in a day camp of all things. We just, we all did it. We all put on makeup for a couple of days and it was nice. And it was sad when I, we had to clean it off before our parents picked up. But man, if there was ever a time I wish that I was born in this time period where we have phones in our pockets, man, I wish there was pictures of that because I think they would blitz my spirit every day up until even now. Absolutely. It seems like a moment of body euphoria. Yeah. And it was before I even obviously didn't even know the word. Like that was then when I was just like, maybe I'm not straight, but it was something even deeper than that. Thank you so much for sharing. That was a very personal question. So thank you, Caleb. And <laughs> no, thanks, anybody Caleb. out there wants to ask Queer Educator, you can click on the link on all of that podcast apps and it'll just send a text message to our website and then we will put your question on the air. Hey, Phil, I really appreciate you taking time this evening to talk to me. I really enjoyed our conversation and all the insight you've been able to give to everybody listening. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. No, thank you. And for people who are listening, you're more than happy to reach me. My Instagram and my ex, we're all the same. It's at Phil Villar, P-H-I-L-V-I-L-A-R. Reach out, talk to me. I'm more than happy to hear your story because... We're, we're not going anywhere. We're only thriving even stronger today. Hang in there. During today's conversation, we uncovered practical strategies for creating safe environments for queer students within educational settings. We gained insight into the impact of representation and visibility in curriculum and classroom discussions. And we learned how personal authenticity can positively influence both students and colleagues, fostering a more inclusive school culture. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this episode of Teaching While Queer. Connect with fellow queer educators and your favorite guests on our online community at www.teachingwhilequeer.org. New community members receive a free resource focused on creating an inclusive classroom environment. Have a great day. Bye.